Hey and welcome to iWizard. So today we're going to take a look at 10 works of historical fiction that I want to read. Stay tuned. Welcome back, Jordan here. So I decided to make this list really because I don't know a ton about the genre of historical fiction. I enjoy learning about history, I always have. I've read a number of books I guess you might call historical fiction. I'm thinking about uh, Charles Dickens' uh, Tale of Two Cities, David Leavitt's uh, The Indian Clerk, uh, Bruce Duffy's The World as I Found It. Um, but I think what really got me on this kick is that I'm currently reading this book, Hawaii, by James Mishner, and it's so incredibly good. I'm enjoying this book so much that I thought, you know, hey, maybe historical fiction is something I've kind of overlooked all these years, and um, I'm thinking maybe I need to get more into this genre. So I decided to catalog uh, a list of the historical fiction books that I've come across over the years. Um, some of these are books that have been recommended to me, but all of these are going to be books that I've been meaning to read for a while and have just put off for one reason or another. The only rule uh, that I decided to follow is to not repeat authors. So it uh, may be that I am excited to read more than one book by some author or another, but that will um, have to be another time. So without further ado, let's get to the list. And one more thing, this list is in no particular order. It's just the 10 historical fiction books that I know I'm going to read over the course probably of this year and next year in no particular order. These are the ones I'm most amped about. Uh, and as always, guys, if you think I've left anything off of the list, there may be some books uh, I've overlooked or that I've never heard of um, or that you just disagree, uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, and uh, since I've already mentioned him, we are going to start our list with number 10, Centennial by James Missioner. So as I said, I'm about a third of the way through Missioner's Hawaii, and this guy is such a great storyteller. He writes these big sweeping novels uh, that are mainly about uh, places and how they came to be uh, and the, the people, the families who settled these places and the cultures uh, and events that have shaped these um, these locales. In fact, Mishner is the guy who wrote uh, Tales of the South Pacific, which won uh, the Pulitzer and eventually became the uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein uh, Broadway musical South Pacific that I'm sure you guys have all seen before. And it's funny, one of the things that really drew me to his work is that the guy just kind of gets me. Every place that Missioner writes about is some romantic or exotic locale with these rich cultures and histories, and they all just so happen to be places that I'm already interested in learning more about. So he's done books on Alaska and America's Eastern Shore and Texas and Mexico and the Caribbean and uh, the history of the Jews and space exploration and a bunch of other uh, books. They're basically fictional stories that take you to different periods in history and then you get to experience uh, again the events that shape those places through the different characters eyes and I'll tell you right now Missioner may be the only writer I've ever encountered who can write about uh, geological formations and like animal migrations and pre-civilizational history in a way that is actually gripping and entertaining like in this book he Starts all the way with, you know, lava shooting out of the sea to form um, the island of that would become Hawaii. And so he really does start uh, at the beginning with these books. But anyways, the one that uh, I am going to check out next is called Centennial. And it's basically the story of the American West. And the way he does it, I guess, is he centers the story in Colorado excuse me, in this fictional town uh, called Centennial in Weld County, which apparently is a real county in Colorado. And it's about cowboys and Indians and trappers and homesteaders and gold seekers, um, traders, all that stuff. So it ends up basically being a story about the history of the West, starting all the way back 
in true missioner fashion with the formation of the land in chapter one and the dinosaurs in chapter two. And then it takes you all the way through the Native Americans and the frontiersmen and the massacres and conflicts, just the entire history of the West told uh, from a bunch of different perspectives, um, the Arapaho warriors and, and cowboys and Amish people and I guess a wealthy English woman and stuff like that. And um, you have militias and farmers and wagoneers. And so I'm really excited to read this one uh, because uh, just with this uh, one book, I can tell I'm going to have to read everything this guy's ever written. Uh, and it turns out that my grandpa, William Hill, uh, read all of Missioner's books over the years. My dad just told me that. So I can't wait to dive into Centennial. Okay, number nine is Augustus. Augustus by John Williams. I've had a fascination with ancient Rome for some time now, and I really want to learn more about the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. And, you know, sometimes the histories, when you read a history book, they can be dry. Uh, they'll focus on things that you're not really interested in. There'll be an entire chapter on Etruscan uh, pottery or something like that. And then you're learning about um, Romulus and Ramus. And it's just everything's really spread out when you get a history of Rome. So I thought it would be fun to dive into these character studies of these emperors and really engross myself in a good story um, and soak up the history kind of that way through fiction. So this one was recommended to me by another booktuber, Joanna, uh, along with um, another book of John Williams's uh, stoner. And so I'm like, if Joanna likes it, I'll probably like it too. So Augustus tells the fictionalized life story of the first and most famous Roman emperor of all, Augustus Caesar, uh, though he never actually claimed the title of emperor himself. And I guess the story is told through letters written by the people surrounding him. Uh, and so that's kind of cool. Uh, and that's pretty much how history is recorded anyways. So I've heard this is really kind of beautifully written, um, a fascinating portrait that is uh, melancholic at times um, by a writer that I'm told was never actually famous in his life, but whose work now seems to be making a comeback. So um, that's going to be number nine. Number eight is Aztec by Gary Jennings. This is one of those books I always see in Barnes and Noble, and I always pick it up uh, and read the back cover. I'm always fascinated by it. So Aztec is exactly what it sounds like. It's the story of the Aztecs, uh, the last and greatest native civilization of North America from the peak and splendor of their capital city Tenochtitlan to the arrival of Cortes and the conquistadors and their destruction of the Aztec empire. So from everything I've heard, this novel is both sort of fun, I guess, in a guilty pleasure sort of way, and also really thoughtful and well-researched. The top Goodreads review of this book was actually really funny, so I thought I'd share that with you. The guy said that you can feel, quote, the sense of wonder, lavish details, so many aspects of so many cultures, also clearly well-researched and engagingly depicted. Um, but the guy also says that the book is filled with atrocity and bloodshed and graphic sex scenes. It is, he says, a, quote, Jacobean soap opera writ large. Candide placed in his trashiest adventure yet. The always horny narrator moving constantly through varied scenes of destruction, despair, body comedies of manner. Uh, periods of learning and excitement, doom and good fortune are doled out plentifully. And this guy ends his Goodreads review by calling Aztec a, quote, combination of the longest boy's adventure ever and a jack-off book of ep epic proportions. It is also lots and lots of guilty fun. Hey, man, so count me in. That sounds... Uh, like a lot of fun. And just looking at the reviews, this uh, book is clearly one of those rise and fall civilizational epics. Apparently it's written as a series of letters to King Carlos of Spain and the letters um, contain a biography of the main character, uh, Mixtly. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, Mixtly. Uh, and so this is, his story is transcribed by Spanish Catholic monks during the 16th century. So it's got the, 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 the feel apparently of history and authenticity. The author claims to have spent 10 years steeping himself in 
uh, Aztec culture, exploring the geography of Mexico, living with the descendants of his characters, apparently, uh, and studying ruins and Aztec ceremonies and and things like that. So um, I don't know if any of that's true, but he also claims to have learned the native language there. Uh, regardless, I am very excited to check this one out, and it's one that I've been wanting to read for quite a while. Okay, number seven is The Warlord Chronicles by Bernard Cornwell. So I've been getting Bernard Cornwell recommended to me for about as long as I've been reading fantasy. The fantasy booktube uh, community swears by the guy, uh, George R.R. R. Martin. I remember him saying that Cornwell writes the best uh, battle scenes and is like the go-to stud uh, for sort of gritty historical fiction set in uh, Western Europe. So Warlord Chronicles is a mixture, uh, I guess, of Arthurian legend and historical fact. It's obviously set in Arthurian Britain, and it tells the story of Arthur as more of a warlord, I guess. And this is the way Cornwell himself describes the trilogy. He says, once upon a time in a land that was called Britain, these things happened. Well, maybe? The Warlord Trilogy is my attempt, he says, to tell the story of Arthur, the once and future king, although I doubt he ever was a king. I suspect he was a great warlord of the 6th century. Nennius, who was one of the earliest historians to mention Arthur, calls him Dux Bellorum, leader of battles or warlord. So apparently um, that's kind of what uh, Bernard Cornwell thinks uh, is the real history. Um, and he apparently Cornwell weaves in uh, Lancelot and Merlin, and I guess Merlin is portrayed as this lecherous, mischievous, but uh, very driven druid. Um, and so the reason I wanted to read this is uh, because I'm fascinated by the Arthurian legends. Uh, I downloaded recently a course from the teaching company about the real history that I'm slowly making my way through. Uh, but I'm also interested in reading a fictionalized uh, version of those events that doesn't go all the way, uh, I guess, to fantasy, but that also doesn't de-romanticize or disenchant the myths like you get with someone like Jack White uh, with his uh, Camulod Chronicles. Cornwell basically takes a middle way from what I've heard, so there's room for readers to uh, take the magic at face value if they want to. So I guess it's how you interpret it. The magic could be real or it could be, and I got this from Wikipedia, it could be, quote, a mixture of coincidence, psychology, primitive technology and delusion, which preys on superstitions and religious fundamentalism. So you get to kind of decide whether you think the magic is real or not. Um, and Cornwell also says that these books are his three favorite of all the books he's ever written. So there you have it from the master himself. Next up, number six, we have Shogun by James Clavell. So this one was written a while ago, and I've probably mentioned this to you guys before, but I'm a big fan of uh, Japanese art and literature. I minored in Asian studies in college, uh, so I got to take courses like um, Asian art and architecture, Buddhist metaphysics, Buddhist ethics, the history of China, cultures of pre-modern Japan. So this book is right up my alley, and I'm kind of surprised that I haven't read it yet. Um, but the thing is, in college, I was reading actual works of pre-modern Japanese literature, like um, Tale of Genji, Tale of the Haiki, um, Life of an Amorous Woman, that sort of thing. So I'd never even heard of Shogun until, um, you know, until I started getting into the whole booktube community. So Shogun is the first book in the Asian saga. It's set in the year 1600, apparently, and it tells the story of an English mariner, John Blackthorne, whose ship is uh, blown ashore. Uh, it reaches Japan, and he is taken captive by the local samurai, and he's the first Englishman, apparently, to reach Japan, uh, which at this point, uh, feudal Japan is a closed society, and it's very exotic and foreign and strange for anyone from the West uh, to, to visit there. And I took this from the book description. Japan at this time is a, quote, land where the line between life and death is razor thin. Blackthorn must negotiate not only a foreign people with unknown customs and language, but also his own definitions of morality, truth, and freedom. As internal strife and a clash of cultures lead to seemingly inevitable conflict, Blackthorn's loyalty and strength of character are tested by both passion and loss, and he's torn between two worlds that will each forever be changed. So that's the sort of uh, dust jacket description. And this is one of those, again, sweeping sagas. Uh, and the Amazon site says that it's also one of the best selling novels of all time, which I didn't know. Um, and one of the highest rated uh, television miniseries as well. Again, I've never seen the miniseries. The New York Times says that Shogun is not only something you read, you live it. 
Um, so anyways, I am pretty excited for this book and uh, this may be the first book I actually read from this list. It may, it may be the next one I go on to when I'm done with Hawaii. So next up we have number five and that is Edward Rutherford's Sarum. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, Sarum. So Edward Rutherford is very similar to someone like James Missioner in the sense that he does these long uh, sweeping sagas that follow four to six uh, fictional families and their descendants and basically chronicles the history of a place uh, from the beginning of civilization to modern times. Uh, and the St. Louis Post said that Rutherford's work is, quote, James Missioner with an English accent. So again, that sounds right up my alley. Uh, so this particular book basically tells the story of England, um, starting with prehistoric Britain in uh, 7500 BC uh, with the arrival of agriculture a few thousand years later, the building of Stonehenge in 2000 BC, the arrival uh, obviously of the Romans and then the Saxons. Uh, and it just keeps going, I guess, period by period uh, all the way up uh, through Norman England, um, the founding of Sarum, which is in Salisbury, the Black Death, the Reformation, the English Civil War, all the way up, I guess, to modern times. So again, a sweeping book. Um, the story is told through uh, six families. And so I'm told that if I do enjoy this book, there are uh, two other books in the series um, that he's done in the same style, I guess. One is called The Forest. Um, which is the history of uh, England's new forest along the southern coast of England, um, which has so much history and tradition and is almost kind of like a mythical place. So that one looks like a lot of fun. And then there's another one uh, just called London uh, as well, which looks amazing. And that one is more recent too, um, from 2002. So that takes us to number four. And there we have none other than I, Claudius by Robert Graves from 1934, a classic Robert Graves was a brilliant writer uh, and poet, just one of the great towering intellectuals uh, of our time. So this book is apparently written in the form of an autobiography of the Roman Emperor Claudius, who was the fourth emperor of uh, the Roman Empire, of course. And so uh, this book tells the history of the Julio-Claudian dynasty uh, from the horse's mouth. And so it's the early uh, years of the Roman Empire from Julius Caesar's assassination uh, to uh, Caligula's assassination in 41 AD. So a lot of history between uh, 44 BC to 41 AD, uh, if you know anything about Rome. And so while this is obviously a work of fiction, the events that happen are drawn from history, uh, from the historical record, um, mostly Tacitus and Suetonius. Uh, and this book was also famously made into a BBC TV series that won apparently all sorts of awards. Uh, I haven't seen it. Um, and then there's a sequel to this book as well, too, from what I've heard. So uh, what I'm really excited about, too, is that this is one of those rare works of historical fiction that is not just considered a fun foray into history, but I, Claudius, is actually considered to be one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. The Modern Library uh, actually ranked it the 14th best novel of the 20th century, and it's on the uh, Time 100 best uh, English language novels of the 20th century as well. So very excited about this one, and I can't believe I haven't read it already. Time for number three, The Master by Colm Toybean. I'm not sure if this would get uh, cataloged as a biographical fiction, or um, maybe that's not even a genre and it's all just historical fiction. I have no idea how they classify these things. But The Master is a novel about the life of the American writer and prose master Henry James, who was a 19th and very early 20th century novelist. Of course, um, James's best known novels are Portrait of a Lady, um, The Bostonians, Daisy Miller, Turn of the Screw, um, and many other good novels, What Maisie Knew. Um, anyhow, this is a novel about a master written by a master. Colm Toybean is one of our best uh, living novelists. I read his novel Brooklyn, which was recently made into a film uh, with uh, Seors Ronin, Seors Ronin, which was actually very good. Uh, and I actually got a chance to see Colm Toybean speak when I was in graduate school. I even got up during uh, the mic period and asked him a question, which he graciously answered. But I digress. 
I uh, have been wanting to to read The Master uh, for many years. It was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, uh, and I also just find Henry James to be a fascinating figure. He had a very privileged upbringing. He was uh, one of uh, he was from one of the first. Uh, sort of intellectual families uh, in America. Obviously, his brother is the famous psychologist and pragmatist philosopher, uh, William James. His father and sister apparently were were famous as well. Um, this book was called A Marvel by John Updike, which to me is high praise. Updike is one of my favorite novelists. And Toy Bean actually uh, wrote another book about Thomas Mann called The Magician that I want to read as well, um, which almost feels like it should be a companion piece uh, to this book, um, uh, The Master. Um, and so um, uh, Thomas Mann, by the way, is one of the greatest writers who's ever lived. So, But I think I'm going to read The Master uh, first. Okay, number two, we have Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett. So this is one that everyone talks about. Uh, my late uh, father-in-law read this book. Uh, I have some other relatives who uh, recently read this book. Uh, people in the booktube world are uh, always talking about this book. Everyone I've ever met uh, who's read uh, Pillars of the Earth says it's really awesome. And the reason I mention this is because when you hear people explain the plot, it sounds almost kind of boring. So this is 12th century England, a civil war is ravishing the country, and amidst all of this, a devout and very ambitious monk is determined to build the greatest Gothic cathedral the world has ever known. So that is like the central conceit of the book. Uh, but everyone says there's much more to it. It's sprawling and uh, sweeping. It's about ambition and power. Uh, and I guess there's so much more to it that I can't even comprehend. So this is apparently the first book in the in his uh, the Kingbridge novels. So I'm putting this one on the list according to basically just the strength of the recommendations that I've gotten. Um, and so guys, maybe let me know in the comments section what all the fuss is about if you've read it. Um, I'll definitely read it, but I'd love to hear more at this point about why you think it's special. So maybe I can bump it up my list. Okay, again, we have made it to number one. And as I said, there's no particular ranking here, no particular order. But the last item on the list is Mary Renault's Ancient Greece Novels. And I just can't pick one, so I'm going to showcase a few of them. I first learned uh, about Mary Renault uh, from reading a piece in The New Yorker by Daniel Mendelssohn, who apparently had a long correspondence with her. Um, I've actually had uh, Mendelssohn on this channel. Great guy, amazing writer, and I've been wanting to read uh, Mary Renault's books ever since I read that piece. So Renault writes these books about typically real, though sometimes invented figures from myth and history. One of them, The Last of the Wine, is written memoir style from the perspective of a young member of uh, Socrates' inner circle. And apparently we get to witness the decline of Athens through his eyes. Uh, there's The King Must Die, which is a fictional account, obviously, of the early life of Theseus, uh, the Athenian king who defeated the Minotaur, if you remember, from high school. And then there's a trilogy of her novels about Alexander the Great, Fire from Heaven, The Persian Boy, and Funeral Games uh, that I want to read as well. I've heard these books are addictive and highly compelling and um, meticulously researched. Um, and the historian Tom Holland said that no other novelist has so successfully evoked the beauty, the charisma, and the terror of ancient Greece. And so as a lover of that period myself, uh, and as someone who teaches about this period in my philosophy class, I'm always fascinated by ancient Greece, the pre-Socratics, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, that whole scene in ancient Athens where we're moving out of the mythopoetic tradition and beginning to philosophize and think about the world, but also everything is steeped in uh, myth. So this, uh, these books of Renault's are right up my alley, and I am just really interested in reading these books. A couple of honorable mentions, I'll end with this. This, Silence by Shasuka, Shusaka Endo, Masters of Rome by Colleen McCullough. That was a close one. It almost made the, uh, the list, but I didn't want to put too much Rome stuff in there. And Killer Angels by Michael Shara. I read Gods and Generals by his son, Jeff Shara, uh, when I was taking a Civil War 
history class in in college. So uh, I've always wanted to read Killer Angels by Michael Shara. And uh, so I'll leave it there. Thank you for watching. Uh, please subscribe to this channel. Catch up with me on Goodreads, Facebook. Tip your starving booktuber on Patreon. And until next time, happy reading, guys. <laughs>